Good morning. Good morning if you're in the West Coast. Good afternoon in, if you are in the East Coast. If you're joining us from farther away, good evening. Um, this is uh, the, my name is Baki, Baki Tezjan. I teach history at the University of California in Davis, and I convene the WhatsApp meetings, WhatsApp in Ottoman and Turkish studies meetings. This is our fifth meeting. Um, and this meeting is uh, the one in which we will present to you the work of one of our prize winners from last year. Uh, the prize, the award uh, that uh, Herman uh, received is named after Vangelis Kekriotis, uh, who was a dear friend to uh, many of us. And in what's up meetings, I usually ask a board member to host the event um, so that you would get to know our board members. For today's meeting, I thought uh, of inviting a former board member, uh, my dear colleague, Christine Filiu. Uh, Christine Filiu teaches at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, she does not need any introduction to anyone. Everybody would know her. I only want to say that uh, her new book is just out, uh, Turkey, A Past Against History from the University of California Press. And uh, she will be having a book talk soon that we advertise on our calendar. I encourage you all to uh, have a look at the calendar, take the date down, and make a, uh, give it a try to attend it because it's a wonderful, beautiful book. Uh, I would like to talk even more about it, but I'm not gonna do that because today we'll remember Juan Guedes and Christine is gonna say a few words and then introduce the panelists. Uh, thank you for joining us, Christine. Thank you. Thank you, Baki. Um, I, I will be brief because we don't have a lot of time, but I um, just wanted to take a moment for us to pause and reflect on Vangelis and his memory. Um, this fund that we raised was in his honor and in his memory, and um, he would be very happy uh, that Herman is giving this talk today and that we're having this exchange. Um, I first met Vangelis in summer of 2000, actually on the Boazici campus, which is fitting and ironic given all that's going on right now. Um, and really from the start of our friendship, he, his unique personality was clear and shown through. And I think you all know what I mean. His enthusiasm for history, for politics, for discussion, for social justice, past and present, um, and just his incredible sociability and generosity um, and his sense of humor. He knew everyone everywhere <laughs> and everyone knew him and was fond of him. Um, I cannot tell you how often his name comes up today, even now in the last few weeks, months, almost six years after his passing um, in conversations with friends in Greece and Turkey and so many other places. Um, so when we lost him, um, Julia Phillips Cohen and I were moved to try to institutionalize his memory in some form. And it was quite easy to raise the money for this purpose. Um, people were very generous and um, we were happy to be able to sponsor. It's a modest, it's a modest fellowship, but it's a gesture um, in his memory. And we've been doing this since 2017 uh, when Sada Payur and Yeliz Teber, both from Oxford received the prize, the fellowship. Um, and then 2018, Yusuf Zia Karabachak uh, from McGill and 2019 Frederick Walter Lorenz. All of those students, I'm not sure about Lorenz, but all of those students knew him and, and worked with him too. So that was an immediate um, connection. And then of course this year, um, Caleb Herbin Adney, Adney, who we're gonna be hearing from today from UCLA. Um, so it's, here's the picture of Angelis on the left for those of you that might not have known him. And it's actually a perfect picture given what's happening right this minute uh, in Turkey. Um, and it shows his involvement in <laughs> all of the things listed below, right? History, economy, sociology, political studies and knowledge and science. So he's 
well remembered. Um, and everyone on this panel today was a friend of his, I think. Um, we have, um, I'll just briefly introduce people and we can get going. Um, let's see, uh, so beginning with um, Ardem Kabadaya, who's our moderator. Um, Ardem received his um, earlier degrees from Metu in Ankara and University of Vienna, his PhD from University of Munich, uh, and he focuses on um, economic, financial, and labor history of the Ottoman Empire, and is currently directing uh, a huge ERC project, Urban Occupations, uh, OETR, um, on digital and spatial humanities of the Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey. Um, Eyal Guineo is associate professor, Eyal will be the discussant, associate professor in the Department of uh, Islam and Middle East Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, uh, and also the director of the Forum for Turkish Studies at the Institute for Asian and African Studies at Hebrew University. And he also needs no introduction. We know his, his books and his uh, contributions to the field, and, and it will be great to have his, his um, thoughts on uh, Herman's work today. And um, Caleb Herman Agney, who we will be hearing much more about in a moment. He is a PhD candidate at UCLA, researching uh, the political economy of the late Ottoman Empire, uh, late Ottoman Macedonia and Thrace rather, and specifically the tobacco industry. And I believe he used the money for research in Greece, but he can tell us more. Um, and with that, in memory of Vangelis, take it away and I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Filiu, and um, to the rest of you as well. Let me share my screen before I start. Okay. So before I start, I wanted to give a uh, robust thank you to Dr. Tess John for coordinating efforts with Dr. Genio and Dr. Kabadaya and Dr. Filiu to make sure that this event came together smoothly. Um, and also the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association in general for hosting this series of talks uh, of which I'm proud to be part. And finally, I wanted to thank the nominating committee for the Vangelis Kekliotis Memorial Travel Grant, which means a lot to me on a personal level because of my deep uh, admiration for Dr. Kekliotis and his rich intellectual legacy. So in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Kavala, as most of you will probably know, was one of the most important Ottoman cities for tobacco production and exportation in the Balkans and was rivaled only by Samsun empire-wide. I analyzed the history of this city and its tobacco trade in relation to other cities in the region connected to it along regional supply chains. Most of the cities uh, in my research belong to the province of Selanik, uh, for example, Drama and Siroz, or Ceres today in Greece, but some of them belong to the neighboring province of Edirne, such as Iskace or Xanthi today, and Karasu Yenijesi, which is now Yenisea in modern Greece. Um, but moving beyond the ge geographic dimension, regional commercial networks and commercial institutions were central to the development of the tobacco trade. A few major factors contributed to the successes of the most prominent tobacco merchants and the turbulence of the industry for those with less fortune. It is therefore possible to trace the transformation of social relations in the tobacco industry by looking at the major defining features of commercial life in Macedonia and Thrace. Most histories of tobacco in the Ottoman Empire have focused on workers' movements, which has provided, provided us with valuable insights into the transformation of tobacco working conditions within industrial urban settings. John Najar, for example, has been a trailblazer in this regard. Feliz de Rolu has helpfully moved the conversation beyond industrial labor and explored the social relations of cultivators and urban merchants. I hope to build on both of these approaches to thoroughly explore the commercial life and the social relations embodied in the political economy of tobacco. I will say more on this in a brief moment, but first I wanted to go through quickly a, a, a who's who of Macedonian or Ottoman tobacco. Various groups of Ottoman merchants were involved in tobacco production, including Ladino, French, and Italian-speaking Jews, Turkish-speaking Donme and Muslims, Greek and Bulgarian-speaking Christians, and some of these subjects were Ottoman subjects, others were consular employees or merchants with extraterritorial privileges. 
Bureaucratic and legal entities also played a significant role in arbitrating commercial relations as the tobacco trade expanded after the 1850s. See the image on the left, for example, for a commercial, case, uh, commercial court case from Salonika. Um, this Salonika commercial court was one such institution. Legislators and local administrators, such as customs officers and members of the administrative councils, also enforced legal commercial behaviors. You can see on the top right uh, image, a Greek translation of one of the most important pieces of legislation on the tobacco trade, for example. Commercial elites and middle-class merchants, along with cultivators who grew their tobacco, were obviously also involved. Some, such as Salomon Alatini, were able to profit off of tobacco from an early period, uh, as early as the 1850s. And he and some of some others in the cadre of tobacco magnates were Jewish entrepreneurs based in Salonika. Not all, however, were Jewish. And as we move forward, it should be increasingly obvious that class allegiances and ethno-religious identities were not always parallel processes in the tobacco trade. So a little more on the research itself. The norms and behaviors of tobacco merchants, i.e. their culture, were produced by political, legal, and economic factors rooted in the mid-19th century. This culture was itself generative of new social fields, to borrow from Pierre Bourdieu, and was intimately tied to contemporaneous historical realities. The integration of the tobacco trade and the regional economy more generally into market dynamics in the 19th century, in other words, created new commercial, political, and legal habits. These habits, which is to say merchants' use of commercial networks, political connections, financial institutions, and the employment of modes of resistance, such as smuggling and violence in some cases, shaped the political economy of tobacco and the, so and the social relations of its participants, i.e. Uh, merchants, cultivators, customs agents, bureaucrats, consular staff, gendarmes, security agents, and others. The linkages between commercial actors understood in this way reveal material and cultural continuities from the roughly or throughout the roughly 55 year period covered in my dissertation, as well as the most significant legal, financial and political institutions which introduced historical ruptures within that timeline. The political economy of tobacco was shaped by the interaction between these spheres of commercial life. And this is something that I think of as a culture of accumulation, uh, since it was defined by commercial norms and behaviors, including immaterial factors which shaped commercial networks, such as religion and ethnicity, which are not an implicit part of the term political economy necessarily. The culture of accumulation defined by these three spheres of commercial life also provides a vantage point on the linkages between seemingly contradictory phenomena, such as illicit trade on the one hand and legal commerce on the other, or violent nationalist activism on the one hand and multi-communal civil organizing on the other. So with the time I have left here, I'd like to provide a few historical examples which will demonstrate the interconnectedness of these habits and the social relations embodied therein. Hassan Akif Pasha, pictured here in the middle, will be the main example used to demonstrate the interaction between these three spheres of commercial life. Uh, Hassan Akif was a member of the Donme community, that is, Jewish converts to Islam following Sabatai Sevi, and the descendant of tobacco traders. He also acted as a vakil or a legal representative in a number of legal cases in Salonika, and he was an administrator of the Teraki or Progress School in Salonika, staffed and attended by other community members. His commercial networks were not limited to his religious community, however, as this document written in Greek testifies. In it, he and the tobacco merchant Ilias Iliadis discussed the details of an agreed upon bill of exchange. The interactions between bureaucracy, legislation, and local political administration on the one hand and commercial networks, economic privileges, and credit markets on the other allowed commercial elites in Salonika to accumulate capital more easily than many of the entrepreneurs based in Kavala and the surrounding region. In particular, the commercial networks and financial institutions available to prominent Salonican merchants decreased the transaction costs that they absorbed in trading tobacco regionally and internationally. In the case of Hassan Akif, his commercial networks were bolstered by legal expertise. As I mentioned, he acted as a vakil in a number of court cases in Salonika. And this expertise extended both to the terms of legal procedures uh, detailed in the commercial code book and other code books and even in the Majelle itself as well as to the available financial instruments. Later in the century, he would make ready use of his access to European credit. He was, for example, one of the first to hold an account with Banque d'Orient 
upon its establishment in 1904. And even before this, it is likely that he also had an account with Banque de Salonique, although this is something I have not confirmed. Uh, this document demonstrates Hasanaki's status as a well-connected member of Salonika and Kavala's commercial elites. In it, his partner Katib Zadeh Mehmet Efendi was represented by a certain Haim Feragi, who uh, some of you may know the name because later on he became a legal advisor to the international financial conglomerate known as the Regi Company, which I will discuss presently. As this audience will undoubtedly be aware, 1881 marks the absorption of tobacco revenues by the Ottoman Public Debt Administration, followed by its passing of the baton to the international financial conglomerate of the Regie Company, which held a monopoly over domestic tobacco revenues and cigarette production until the end of imperial rule. <clears throat> what is less well known is the way that the transaction costs associated with adhering to Regie policies were not evenly absorbed by merchants in the trade, as I will demonstrate. The Alatini brothers, Jewish tobacco magnates and financiers from Salonika, which we briefly mentioned already, established the Banque de Salonique in 1888, expanding to establish a branch in Kavala, specifically devoted to the financing of tobacco in 1893. In the same year, the Banque de Salonique made an agreement with the Regie, allowing it to continue funding tobacco in the Balkans and selling it within Macedonia and Bosnia. It was only a year later, in 1894, that the Alatinis founded the famous commercial company of Salonika Limited which would continue to play a crucial role, role in the development of an industrial tobacco hub in Kavala. What this demonstrates is that regional commercial elites were hardly unraveled by the introduction of the Regie Company. As early as the 1860s, the Alatinis were engaged directly in tobacco trading with the Akif family and others. And as John Najjar demonstrates, this commercial cooperation would continue until at least 1911 when the tobacco magnates of Kavala, including the Alatinis, the Herzogs, and Hassan Akif himself, would act in unison to close up their factories in defiance of strikes carried out by employees of the Herzog factory. Hassan Akif, therefore, maintained a relatively privileged position within the tobacco industry as a member of this elite cadre of merchants with widely distributed market networks and robust personal networks within the broader political economy of Salonika. This allowed him to avoid or defer transaction costs associated with regie policy as it became a more significant player in the regional tobacco trade. To put this slightly differently, participating in the market was not as expensive for him as it would be for merchants who were either less privileged or who traded exclusively on the domestic market, which would become the domain of the regie company. One such transaction cost that Hassan Akif avoided was the market losses associated with the requisite transfer of unsold tobacco to Regis storehouses for inspection and pricing following its 1883 establishment. The document on the left demonstrates that Hassan Akif, Akif was adept as both a vakil as well as an industrialist and successfully avoided the transaction costs associated with depositing tobacco in Regis warehouses and instead legally obligated other contracted parties, such as uh, a certain Mola Rejep in this case, to cover his own market losses for storing the tobacco and to cover those of his client for not receiving the originally contracted amount from Mola Rejep. Uh, the combination of broad legal knowledge, key commercial networks and robust financial institutions were not necessarily guaranteed for other regional tobacco merchants, such as Lucas Grigoriadis in the document on the left, who came to court in 1886 for violating regime policy and engaging in smuggling or kachak chaluk, according to the document. In Grigoriadis' case, the commercial court provided him with a forum for challenging the regime, but it did not give him the same political, legal, and commercial clout enjoyed by Hassan Akif Pasha outside um, of that context. Regie policies effectively prohibited a number of merchants like Grigoriadis from exporting their tobacco from Kavala in spite of its limited monopoly over domestic production and sales. Such merchants would be categorized as smugglers, not merely for avoiding customs duties and legal fees as in previous decades, but for not recognizing the jurisdiction or the vazife veselahiet of the Regie company. Purchase slips like the one on the right were a crucial part of this process. The networks utilized by merchants to source, process, and transport their tobacco became assets in their commercial portfolios, 
which became increasingly defined by illegal behavior or the quote unquote black market, at least according to the regime's definition. Extraterritorial extra status did not guarantee that a merchant could avoid the transaction costs of regime policy as shown by the document on the left, wherein the regime accused an employee of the French consulate in Kavala named Petros Bulgaridis of smuggling. In spite of petitions written by Bulgaridis and his fellow export merchants in Kavala, an example of which is included on the right, the regime continued to accuse export merchants of smuggling for conducting business as usual, at least from the perspective of the merchants themselves. The establishment of the regime was to entrepreneurial merchants in Kavala and other neighboring cities, the continuation of political economy dynamics which favored commercial elites like the Alatinis, the Modianos, the Herzog Company, and our protagonist today, Hassan Akif. However, with the integration of tobacco revenues into the orbit of international financial control, to borrow uh, the terminology of Joshkin Tunjad, commercial resistance took on new political implications. The regime contributed to an already well-established set of political economy factors, which simultaneously drew entrepreneurs of the tobacco trade into the market while failing to satisfy their ambitions. Uh, see the, you can see, for example, the British Vice Consul Davies of Kavala in 1872 already uh, commenting on dissatisfaction among tobacco merchants. After the establishment of the regime, local merchants were immediately critical of its policies. In this sense, it was ushered into an unwelcoming commercial environment from its inception. That environment had already been conditioned by the commercial activities of tobacco magnates like the Alatinis and Hassan Akif, however. The above mentioned processes that created high transaction costs for local merchants were accompanied by limited compensation and poor working conditions for cultivators and for workers. The uneven absorption of transaction costs by various segments of regional society created the conditions for labor organizing and commercial activism in a number of different forms. Commercial societies such as the Drama Tobacco Congress and the Kavala Tobacco Congress, for example, organized for the advancement of local tobacco producing conditions. Uh, Multi-communal labor organizing also accelerated at the turn of the century. These organizations re and activities reflected the political model, uh, excuse me, the political model of Ottoman populism embodied in the Committee for Union and Progress. In Mehmet Javid Bey's 1909 speech, for example, he addressed, quote, citizens of whichever race you belong to, whether Muslim, Greek, Jewish, Albanian, etc., as the beloved children of the homeland, unquote. However, the conditions that allowed for these cooperative models of organizing went hand in hand with separatist and nationalist models, as well as workplace violence and banditry along trade routes. In addition to the multi-communal cooperatives like the aforementioned congresses, nationalist commercial organizations and activities also became common from the 1870s onwards. This document, for example, shows a request by Bulgarian merchants in Kavala to form their own cooperative entity specifically designed to address the commercial interests of Bulgarian Ottomans. The conflict between patriarchists or Greek Orthodox Christians and exarchists or Bulgarian Orthodox Christians in particular became increasingly visible within the tobacco trade as the murder of the tobacco merchant Haji Yorgiev in 1909 demonstrates. According to the documentation, a group of Greek merchants described as a rebel band or a shakavet chetesi murdered Haji Yorgi in broad daylight on the streets of Iskice after merely a few years of commercial disputes beginning in 1905. The event was followed by anti-Greek demonstrations in drama shortly thereafter, demonstrating that this intercommunal violence was not limited to specific cities, but actually um, connected them as well. Our protagonist, Hassan Akif, again, was familiar with both class conflict as well as ethno-nationalist activism of various sorts. In 1907, a regime inspector and an employee at the Akif Tobacco Processing Factory in Salonika got into a knife fight, which ended in death. That same year, a group of Bulgarian bandits stole tobacco belonging to Hassan Akif as it was being transported. Indeed, by the turn of the century, it would seem that the culture of accumulation had given way to a culture of conflict and resistance. Neither the culture of violence and resistance that had been born out of the social dynamics of the tobacco trade nor the tobacco trade itself disappeared after the Balkan Wars. 
However, with the solidification of new political realities, such as new nation states in the Balkans and the increasingly important role of the international community during World War I, tobacco merchants of all stripes faced new difficulties. Hassan Akif, for example, utilized his vast personal and market networks to relocate to Germany, where he died in 1917 in Munich. Uh, his company, in spite of conducting business with the Central Powers during World War I and being subsequently blacklisted by the Entente Powers, would live on under the leadership of his heirs. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Other exoduses were equally sad, or perhaps more so, as the memoirs of Ismail Hakke Kobakizadeh attest. His family was deeply involved in tax collections from tobacco merchants in and around Kabbalah. And in the population exchange of 1922 to 1923, he and a number, uh, many other Kabbalah Muslims fled to Turkey. At the same time, Greek Orthodox refugees from Asia Minor poured into Kabbalah, Salonika, and other cities and took refuge in many different public spaces. One of these spaces was, in a symbolic turn of events, the Imaret complex of Egypt's Mehmet Ali, who was originally from Kavala. Another one was the Ahiropitos church in Salonika, the pillars of which refugees drilled holes into to hold their cots like a sort of unwanted collection of bunk beds to support their exile. These refugees would forever change the demographics of the region and would play a major role in the establishment of Kavala as a Mecca of tobacco, or Mecca to Kapnu, for decades to come. In spite of this turbulence, some tobacco merchants, such as Judah Perachia, a Jewish tobacco merchant uh, who worked in cooperation with the Albatini family and who is pictured on the left, were able to mobilize their significant commercial networks in Salonika, Kavala, and the hinterlands to continue trading tobacco deep into Bulgaria, Austria, and Germany to the north, and further south in Egypt and eventually Palestine. In many ways, Judah Perachia inherited a commercial world like that of Hassan Akif earlier, which was quote unquote cosmopolitan in that he conducted business with disparate communities of Greeks, Bulgarians, Muslims, fellow Jews, and foreign companies based in the United States and elsewhere. But at the same time, this cosmopolitanism masked a series of overlapping social fissures that continued to shift and develop over time as populist politics inspired a new generation of nationalists fascist occupiers, communist labor organizers, and others to mobilize tobacco workers and or merchants depending on their immediate objectives. Ultimately in my research, I am trying to demonstrate that regional commercial networks played a significant role in the way that Ottoman policies and international financial programs were implemented within the tobacco industry. Black market portfolios, commercial nationalism, and labor organizing were responses to the development of a political economy which had favored commercial elites from Salonika and Istanbul on the one hand and international financiers from Western Europe on the other. Much as global trade and geopolitical competition shaped regional politics and nationalist activism, it is my contention that the regional tobacco trade was not merely a stage for political conflict and nationalist activism, but also that it generated these phenomena. Thank you very much. Dear Herman, thank you very much. Uh, and also thanks for uh, good timekeeping. Now I'm passing the word to Eyal Eugenio as a discussant. Eyal, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Erdem. And thank you very much, Herman, for your uh, amazing uh, presentation. But before moving to my uh, comments, I would like to start by thanking uh, Baki uh, for inviting me to take part in this commemorative uh, evening dedicated uh, to the memory of uh, my, and I suppose our uh, late uh, friend uh, Vangelis, which we are all uh, missing. And Congratulations to uh, Herman for uh, receiving the prize that enabling, enabled him to, uh, to develop his project uh, so impressively. And I must say that I think that I met Herman for the first time back in Salonika uh, two years ago and later in Jerusalem when he was just at the beginning of his project. And I was amazed now to, to read its, its outcome and I suppose like everyone else, I was uh, very much impressed by the diversity of the sources written in all kinds of Ottoman languages, 
Ottoman Turkish, but also Greek, uh, Ladino, not to speak about German, uh, French, and then his ability to combine economic history, legal history, uh, social history, cultural history, uh, to produce uh, such interesting and innovative um, a study of late Ottoman uh, Macedonia. So many thanks, Herman, and good luck uh, with your ongoing project. And now, when I, I read uh, uh, the material that Herman uh, gave me, it was, was his introduction and a, a chapter of his work, I was, of course, uh, reminded of what happened a century earlier in. 18th century Salonika won another commodity as uh, a coffee actually uh, changed and transformed uh, the city and enabled a new strata uh, of merchants. Most of the Muslim merchants that traded coffee uh, from Egypt and towards all uh, parts of the Balkans. Um, and the, com the comparison, I think, is, is very uh, illustrative. Many of the things that uh, Herman uh, dealt or is dealing with them in his project uh, were already evident a century before. The state's obsession, of course, with tax evasion and smuggling is uh, one uh, clear point. The dependence on interregional um, networks, uh, the sectarian characteristic uh, of the commerce, um, we're all there. But of course, as Herman shows us very well, there are also a lot of new developments that have to be taken into account. Some of them, uh, the economic transformations, uh, new players, uh, the state's ability uh, to intervene and to control, uh, taking important part in Herman's discussion. But with your permission, uh, with a few moments that I got, I would like uh, to focus more on the social um, features of uh, his uh, discussion. And this led me to, to, to some general questions that I would be glad to, to hear, uh, Herman, your opinion. One of them, of course, is uh, what you just described also in your presentation, uh, looking through the tobacco commerce to, to uh, retrieve all kinds of conflicts, violence, etc., especially as we are moving in time towards the uh, Balkan Wars, the rise of nationalism. I think that from the examples that you showed us, um, Bulgarian, Greek uh, identities come to the fore uh, very much and have and had a significant impact on the commerce. However, and maybe following uh, Dina Danone's uh, last book on 19th century Izmir, uh, I would like to ask you about the significance of uh, class and to which extent do you think that discussing class uh, could elaborate uh, or enrich your discussion, moving maybe not away because they, of course they are very significant, but adding to our understanding what happened in late Ottoman uh, Macedonia. Of course, you are using the term uh, class when describing and differentiate between your different uh, merchants. But I, I would like to ask whether you could find, you know, class not only as a source of conflict, but also of a kind of identity, social identity, cultural identity that developed uh, in Macedonia that transcended uh, ethnical, religious uh, identities. Uh, so this is, of course, a very broad uh, question, but I would like uh, to hear uh, your insight about this uh, topic. The other uh, question here again, admittedly a very big question, uh, goes back to the social change that was triggered by the tobacco uh, commerce. Um, you know, as I said, in 18th century Salonika, uh, the coffee enabled Muslim merchants originally, most of them originally from Kayseri, so apparently they were not part of the Dunme or a Ma'aminim a group, uh, to dominate much not only of the economic life of 18th century Salonika, but also to leave their impact on the city infrastructure at that time by supporting uh, tekes, by establishing new mosques, 
uh, Friday marks, something that used to be done in Salonika only by governors and representatives of the state in the 18th century. We see a move towards those merchants who were, who were taking the lead in such a charitable activity. How much of this connection between the rise of new elite in uh, Salonika, but mostly in Kavala, was reflected in the impact of this new elite on the city. Now, of course, with regard to Salonika, we have a lot of uh, discussions. You know, for example, the connection between the Dunmer community and the modernization of Thessaloniki, of the relation between the Alatin and Modiano families and the development of Jewish, uh, modern Jewish education in the city. But we know much less about Kavala. And I think that actually Kavala is a much more interesting story uh, because as you show in your writing, Kavala, even though that it's an ancient city, what happens in the second half of 19th century, Kavala is amazing. The city attracts immigration and uh, investment from all over the Balkans and over Macedonia and uh, beyond. But still, uh, we know very little about happening in the city itself from this uh, point of view. We know about what Mehmet Ali did in the 1840s, but your new elites that came to dominate the city, many of them immigrants, uh, how much did they transform a Kavala and in, in what, um, and which were the aspects with which uh, they dealt uh, in uh, the city? Um, and, and another, and maybe the last thing is actually moving from the elite towards the simple workers that also a present in your uh, work. And here again, we have uh, some works about the tobacco workers in Salonika. But I will ask you maybe to move the discussion to Kavala, because here again, the immigration is much more important uh, than in Salonika. Many of the immigrants actually are coming from Salonika. So if I'm going back to the question of class, not only the upper class, but do you see a kind of uh, class aspect uh, about the transformations? Because as you said at the end of your presentation, we are used to speak about late Ottoman Macedonia, mostly from the growing conflict, religious and ethnic conflicts that devastated uh, the area. And of course, we know the end of the story. So. I suppose this enabled us till now to, to focus on the ethnic tensions and the religious tensions. And class maybe could uh, provide other um, leadings. So thank you again for the opportunity to, to read uh, your amazing work and good luck. Yeah, thank you very much. And I would also like to welcome all uh, as the moderator of the session. Maybe you joined late. Uh, I am moderating uh, this discussion. And I think uh, Dr. Ginyo asked uh, three largish questions. Uh, so, Herman, if it's okay for you, I would uh, suggest that you respond. And then in the meantime, uh, the other participants, if they want to ask questions, I would kindly ask you to use uh, the raise your hand function in, in Zoom, and I'll just take a note and then get back to you for your questions and remarks. Herman. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Genio, your questions are great and very thought provoking. Um, I will try to keep my answers brief though, because these are the questions that I pr probably am thinking the most about right now, actually. And class is an ongoing issue in the research because, uh, because of the way that class and ethno-nationalism overlap and because allegiances are shifting in the period that I'm looking at. And so you have, um, Sometimes a convergence of those interests, as in the case uh, of intercommunal violence that I described um, in the presentation. And other times you have class interests developing uh, separately from ethno-nationalist uh, allegiances. 
And so I'm looking at works on Azerbaijan and Russia to try and uh, flesh out my own understanding of this. But um, another thing that makes it difficult to trace in the case of Kavala specifically is that a lot, as you mentioned, a lot of the labor is migrant labor. And the documentation therefore is um, scattered. It's difficult to come by. And um, so I, I'll leave the class question there for now. Perhaps we can discuss it a little bit further. Um, one of the things that I am, well, I, I guess I will say one more thing about it. One of the things that I am trying to uh, illustrate in the dissertation itself is that class is to a certain degree shaped by transaction costs, which is why I make a distinction between commercial elites and local regional middle-class merchants because they had less access to credit um, and they were, uh, the transaction costs that they actually absorbed were greater um, within the tobacco trade. But moving on to your question about Kavala, it's also a difficult question because much of the evidence, much of the documentation is anecdotal. And at least the documentation I have, a lot of it comes from the Salonika Commercial Court or from the Bashpakan look. And so uh, I am getting sort of a second uh, filter there because the, the cases that end up in Salonika are appeals from Kavala. I don't have access to the original cases most of the time or um, to a more robust set of documentation from Kavala itself. So, you're right to bring up that issue. And I hope that I can um, continue to, to, to broaden my scopes and include more, more documentation from Kavala itself. Every time that I have gone to Kavala, the, doc, the archive there has been closed. Um, I've been there, I think, I don't know, a dozen times and every time the, the, the archive itself is closed. So hopefully I'll have better luck after the pandemic, um, but thank you for bringing up those issues. And in the meantime, uh, dear participants, you can also use uh, the chat box. Uh, any questions and remarks from the floor? Dimitrios, Dimitri, just a second. Yes, please. I think, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. I wasn't sure. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, Herman, like, I haven't met you, but like, your research is. Really, really good. I love it, and uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to hear and read more stuff about what you're doing. And uh, it's uh, just one thing. Sometimes people get tend to get a little bit competitive when they start with the same thing. I do quite similar things, and I love that other people do it as well. That means that you don't need to do stuff that other people can do it. Let's say read the commercial code cases because Herman did it and then I can read his article. So one question I would like to ask is, you spoke about regional commercial networks and I would like to ask you if you ever found any traces, what were the connections between the merchant class of Thessaloniki and the, the class of financiers and bankers in Istanbul in the 1870s? Because like the 1870s is like a moment, you know that, almost all of the people here know that. It's a moment of like rapid capital accumulation for financiers because of lack of access of the Ottoman Empire to, to, to global markets of uh, capital. And so they would use intermediaries, et cetera, et cetera. The story is kind of known. I'm also in the process of looking where these people would invest their capital and where they would invest their capital for commercial gains, where they invest their capital for political gains, to build their own political profile. So this is my perspective here, but I'm curious to see from your research, if you find any traces, any connection, let's say between Alatini and Zografos, just to say a name, or other famous bankers, not only Greeks, Armenians, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, I, I can ask so many things, but <laughs> let's give it some. So thanks so much. Thank you very much. And I completely agree with you that it's exciting when someone else does something similar because 
I have benefited immensely from other works on tobacco trade in, in, in particular. Um, so I feel the same way. Uh, I don't see it as a threat at all. Um, but in terms of the question, uh, I suppose the w I can only answer based on the documentation that I have, um, which often I, I have come across a number of commercial court cases that involve the Ottoman bank, for example, but don't um, necessarily are, are not are not uh, involving the same names that you you know, Zografos is not mentioned, for example, um, but rather the local, the local uh, branch, the local shube of the Ottoman bank is detailed. So the people working there and the case that uh, they're raising against this uh, particular merchant will be described in detail. But um, so there's obviously connections with Istanbul because of the Ottoman bank in particular, um, but uh, the actual specific personal networks that you're trying to ask about are something that I'm still trying to sort of unravel. Um, and part of the problem is that the, the staff is changing for the Ottoman bank as well, right? So one year you'll have um, a number of cases with uh, a certain nausea, and then the next year you'll have someone else in charge. So it's, it's difficult to trace, but it's something that I'm working on. And I hope with uh, your help, I'll be able to uh, make those connections more explicit. Okay. I just read that in the chat box, in the private message to me that Professor Tezjan Baki has a question. He cannot raise his hand, he's the host, therefore Baki. Um, Herman, thanks so much for this wonderful presentation. I'm going to ask you something that's not part of your presentation. And the reason I'm asking is, is if you were to go eventually and present this as a job talk at an American university, uh, it, it, people might ask, uh, you know, what is it with Turkish tobacco, United States, etc. Uh, did that, uh, probably that didn't enter your area of research because you're looking really in the socioeconomic history over there. But I'm just curious, did American tobacco companies enter the Ottoman Empire during this period? I always found it very weird that the land where tobacco first originated ended up having this uh, fascination with Turkish tobacco that, that it still continues on camels, uh, uh, you know, boxes and stuff. And so is that, did that story start around this time or later or before? Do you have any uh, uh, comments on that? Did it ever cross uh, your uh, area of study? Yeah, finally, a, 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 a pretty easy question by comparison to Dr. Genio and Sergiopoulos. So um, the American tobacco companies become involved in uh, Ottoman tobacco quite early on. I have documentation, for example, from the Highlander Tobacco Company uh, from North Carolina, I believe it is, um, directly communicating with uh, Abdul Hamid and sending him their own, uh, sending, sending him personal boxes of tobacco. So the, the connection there is uh, established early on, but in terms of actual commerce, um, American tobacco companies uh, become deeply involved in Kavala and Xanti production at the beginning of the 20th century, so around 1903 and 1904. Uh, you have a number of companies from the United States establishing branches there and exporting tobacco as a result. Thanks for that. Professor Kosaba wants to join the discussion. Yes. Hojam. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is really a great um, uh, presentation and, and really exciting work. I'm looking forward to reading it. And thank you also, Baki and, and Christine, for giving us an opportunity to remember Vangelis, who was, of course, a wonderful friend, a beautiful person. So thank you very much. I do want to go back to Eyal's question, actually, uh, at the expense of making things a bit more difficult again. Uh, the um, uh, it's you know the class and ethnicity, the 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 two um, uh, forms of identity or whatever. Uh, you said that they sometimes overlap, sometimes they don't. 
Uh, the question, of course, is with class, if you go to the classical sort of definition, it's the relational concept. It's always, you know, um, employer, employee, etc. Whereas with ethnicity and religious, maybe, but especially national identities do have an invented element to them. Uh, and the story of the region, of course, is that the latter uh, eventually overwhelmed the former and then defined uh, the history of the region. So I was wondering in your study of these in the Bulgarian, Greek, etc., communities, um, do you see, I mean, uh, how do these in, in their day-to-day -day trade, uh, do you see um, any one of these, I mean, ethnic, ethnic identities, etc., um, playing an important role in terms of who they trade with or, or what do they do, who they protect, etc. cetera, uh, in, especially in the earlier part. Is that, is that an element or is it something that becomes more prominent later? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question because uh, in the earlier period, there are merchants, for example, Hassan Akif, as I mentioned, he has robust commercial networks with especially other donme and um, and uh, the Jewish, you know, the, the most prominent Jewish families of Salonika, such as the Aladinis and the Modianos. But he also does trade with uh, Greek speakers like Ilias Iliadis, as I mentioned, and Anastasiou, other, another tobacco merchant from Xanthi. Um, so you have people like this, but you also have folks who are trading specifically with other Bulgarian, like Bulgarian merchants who only trade with Bul other Bulgarian merchants, for example, and exclude Greeks from their commercial networks. Um, but that's something that, from what I can tell, and again, this is not like a scientific answer, but it's an anecdotal answer. It seems that that's something which develops later in the century. Um, those tensions, of course, existed prior, but the actual exclusion of uh, members of other ethnic groups in the case of the Bulgarian Greek dispute, it seems to be something that develops later on. Uh, I hope that that answers your question, but the class and ethnicity issue is also one which is geographically bounded, geographically determined. So in the case of Xanthi, for example, you have a number, you have uh, tobacco cultivators who are predominantly Bulgarian speakers and uh, or Muslims. Um, Whereas in the case of drama, it's not very far away, but it's a different um, it's a different ethnic makeup, which overlaps with class in some ways because of the fact that you have uh, concentrated elements of society, ethnically speaking, uh, positioned within a certain class um, dynamic. So yes, it's um, it's a relational it's relational, but ethno-religious identities some, somehow become grafted on to that relation, if that makes uh, a bit more sense. Herman, if I may, can I ask a question as the moderator? Yes, um, thanks for this. I hope we've got still some time, so I hope I'm not um, stealing time from any other uh, participants. Uh, so, I haven't read your work, but uh, like AI has just said, just from the presentation, it's clear that you were one of the lucky um, researchers who had uh, the chance to visit several archives and go through different genre of sources. And we don't only envy you, uh, because uh, if you are experienced, then you know that more the merrier is not always the case with the archival documentation. So I would like to ask you, your reflection about, you know, if you've got these different types of sources coming from different uh, archival uh, locations, uh, it also creates challenges as you probably experienced. So could you please reflect on the advantages and the challenges and possible methodological solutions to work with uh, diverse material coming from different uh, archival sources? Yes, I'll do my best. I mean, <laughs> it is an ongoing issue. And the, the issue is that you add sources and those sources provoke you <laughs> to find new sets of data, right? And so, I mean, just a week ago, I was having a conversation with Dr. Genio about, about my sources in particular, and we were discussing how, how helpful it would be if I had access, if I could go back to Istanbul 
and get uh, access to the uh, customs registers to find out how um, commonplace smuggling really was prior to the establishment of the regime. A question that I'm you know, still struggling to establish fa facts and data for because of the anecdotal nature of most of my sources, right? And that would be great. I hope to do that. But of course, doing that will provoke a new set of questions. So it's an ongoing, at some point, you have to stop and say, okay, I'm going to write based on this documentation that I have. And right now, it seems as though I will be, I will be continuing to write based on uh, most of all the Salonika com commercial court cases, because I think those are the most fascinating, the most interesting in terms of um, commercial networks and credit in particular, um, but also because they provide insight into class dynamics, as we've been mentioning, um, and they also provide insight into uh, the establishment and, and maintenance of commercial networks, which were sometimes, as I mentioned, multi-communal, but oftentimes also limited to um, certain ethnic communities. And so that's where I'm at with it now, but of course it continues to evolve. And the internet is a, a wonderful, and terrible thing because Hati Digital Library has an enormous number of sources in many, many different languages, <laughs> all relevant to the tobacco trade in Macedonia and Thrace. And so, um, yes, it's, it's, I mean, I think, that, I hope that I've answered your question, but it's, it is difficult for me. Yes. Thank you for that. I mean, I also had the chance to work in that archive in the Salonika court record, I mean, the commercial court archives. I, it's not a surprise to me that you will prioritize that collection, surely. Uh, but the fact I is- gonna, in... I was just gonna add one more thing, Dr. Kuzaya. I mean, I prioritize that collection um, because it's the most robust of my, of my documents. I have thousands of, and thousands of pages from, from that archive, but also, um, when I have to prioritize other documents, I try and always think about what's going to be the most interesting. And so I have a collection of bills of exchange written in Greek, for example, from about, you know, between tobacco merchants. I don't think that that is something, I think that that is the kind of document that needs to be written about, even if it might be difficult and might be in some, sometimes boring to read those, those documents. It's actually not something that frankly, most people can do. And then it's also not something that um, has been done yet. And so I feel obligated to include sources like that um, as well. Thank you. Further questions, remarks? Yes, Elife Bicher de Vigi. Thank you very much. And also thank you for inviting me to attend the meeting at uh, this maybe one blessing of the pandemic that we can attend the international meeting. I'm based in Switzerland so at the moment so and um, yeah I am happy uh, uh, to hear and I find the your work Herman very fascinating and very relevant. My remark is on on, on, on aspects which might not be in the scope of your project, but uh, yet I want to ask, um, during the 19th century, um, there were two other commodities in the Ottoman Empire, which became very important, relevant for the economy. These are the opium and the alcoholic beverages. And uh, I wonder if you see any overlaps with these commodities in the sources which you have selected or which you have access to it? Thank you. Um, it's a good question. The simple answer is no. Uh, the documentation that I'm using for my dissertation does not deal with, with um, opium, alcohol, or coffee. But um, another side project that I'm trying to work on, I'm write, trying to write an article about uh, medical discourses on tobacco and coffee in the Levant. So there are a number of sources written in Arabic, um, which um, adopt an earlier anti-tobacco 
stance, or there's, there is rather a debate from the early modern period between pro-tobacco and anti-Ottoman, anti-tobacco writers rather. Um, and this debate becomes reinvented at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. And I'm trying to write an article about that. So opium and coffee become relevant to that conversation, but not to my dissertation. Thanks, Herman. Any further questions? Or if you want, you can also use the chat box, as I said. Avi, Avi Rubin. Yeah, um, sorry, I have to switch on my uh, camera. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Herman. It was a great uh, thought-provoking uh, talk. Thank you for that. Um, I wonder if you can say a few words about how you treat the commercial court records um, being such a central um, source for you, as I understand. I mean, do you do you treat it as a reservoir of uh, data or? Do you take into account the impact of court procedures on the interactions that went on, went on in these courts? Uh, and of course, the, 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 the court record um, is not a transparent source, right? Um, it never been. Also, it, it goes for the Sharia, uh, for the Sigil, uh, all the more so for, the, for these specific court records. So in the 19th century, following the reforms, we know that it has its own intricacies, its own uh, jargon, which impact uh, litigants strategies. So I wonder if you take that into account in your analysis and the narrative and if yes, how? Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I have taken your work as a roadmap in this regard um, in the sense that I'm constantly referring between the commercial cases themselves and the actual code books, which are supposed to uh, dictate what happens in the court, right? And so um, the interplay sometimes there is, is clear. Sometimes it's quite obvious that the, the players in the game are trying to follow the rules. They're trying to observe the written rules in the code books. Other times um, it becomes clear that personal networks play a role in how a court proceeding, uh, in how a case proceeds. Um, but at a basic level, I'm always trying to read these cases, uh, not just to um, uh, gather data, as you say, but read them as text, read them as a living document, which represents the social relations of the people involved both within the court and outside of the court, which is where the commercial networks, of course, become incredibly relevant. Um, the connections between administrative council members and local merchants becomes incredibly central. Um, so, so I am not looking at them just for quantitative data. That is valuable. There are um, There is one year in particular that I am trying to do that with, but it's not my normal uh, approach to the documents themselves. Thanks, Roman. Any further remarks? Right? Then if there I think are I'll no thank more, yes, if there please. are no more questions, thank I just you. wanted to uh, announce and remind people. Uh, I'm sending it uh, in chat box here a link for our awards and prizes. Uh, announced in, uh, on February 26th via email. It's on our website. Um, please consider applying to uh, a category that fits uh, you. There are categories from undergraduate students all the way to senior scholars uh, you know, that, you, that you could apply to. And then if you win, 
you get to present your work in one of these settings where you get feedback from all over the world. Look at this. We have people joining us from Israel, from Switzerland, from the West Coast, uh, all over. Uh, so uh, please consider uh, applying to one of our awards. And I'd like to thank everyone, everyone uh, for uh, joining today. Uh, Ardem, thank you so much for uh, moderating the session. Uh, Ial, thank you so much for your discussion, for your commentary. Herman, uh, your award is clearly very well deserved. Uh, and I should also take a moment to acknowledge the people who uh, were in the committee. Uh, I believe Ramazan Akpurstan was the chair of the committee who teaches at Bosphorus University. Um, so a lot of people put their time and service into these committees to uh, read the applications and pick the winner. And I would like to thank especially to Christine for joining us this morning and uh, uh, helping us uh, remember Vangelis. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining us. Thank you so, so much. And in next month, we have another WhatsApp meeting uh, and our guests will be two authors of very new books. Uh, so please join our email list, follow us on Facebook or Twitter to find out more about them. Uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Baki. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you and good luck. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.